Okay, the, the live button. <laughs> we're we're live. So today, um, we're live. I have Andrew Hoekstra. I have Tyler Bethauser, and I have Renee Stevens. Um, and we're gonna try to get into it as fast as we can, and we'll weave in introductions and stories about where we work and what we do um, throughout throughout the broadcast today. Um, but um, just real quick, so. My name is Charles Elwood. I run a company called Solusmatica. We do Power BI business intelligence for the marketing world. Um, but I recently got into collecting stories and I applied for LinkedIn Live and um, I got approved. So, so right now I'm bringing in all these interesting people um, to tell their stories. And we have a couple stories about elephants that I'll try to weave in at, at the end of this live broadcast. So, so stay tuned for that because there's some really funny, interesting stuff. Um, so just real quick, maybe we do some introductions about, um, just your name real quick and the, the company that you're with, um, and kind of, um, just a quick story of what that company does. So maybe Andrew, we start with you and we'll go Tyler, then Renee, and then, um, we'll just start with there with some quick introductions maybe about your company. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, so I'm Andrew Hookstra. I have a consulting firm uh, in artificial intelligence and machine learning called Point Vector. Uh, essentially, we help at either the business data level or into the engineering applications, working with uh, embedded devices and putting uh, smaller algorithms on embedded devices. All right, interesting, yeah. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tyler Bethauser. Um, I'm a business analyst at Freight Verify. Uh, Freight Verify is a small company um, out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we essentially provide real-time visibility to companies' uh, supply chains, and then on top of that, provide analytics so that we can help um, essentially speed up the go-to-market and uh, uh, for both the inbound and outbound product. So ensuring that we get um, data to our customers that they can make good decisions about you know when to order parts or um you know essentially where their product is at any time interesting oh very cool awesome. and renee yeah renee stevens vice president of automotive at we predict and as our name implies um, we are a predictive analytics company um also based in ann arbor and swansea wales um, we have um, we, we focus mainly on automotive and looking at automotive components and um, doing component benchmarking and looking basically across to provide people, engineers, suppliers, um, OEMs, a view on what's happening on their vehicles today and then what's about to happen in the next one year, two year, three year, four year, five years so they can get ahead of trends and, um, and, and react appropriately. Oh, wow. Very cool. Okay. So, um, the, the question, there's a little bit of feedback here, but the question I think that a lot of audience members have is, um, you know, and I get this question a lot is, you know, is BI new? What is Power, Power BI? How do you say that? Um, you know, data analytics, what, what, what is all this new stuff, right? Um, but, you know, we had a conversation about a week ago and um, what was really interesting is in the automotive world and transportation, and Andrew can talk to some of this too, is we've actually been living data for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I think Renee, you you have experience even further back. Um, so, you know, I, I wanna go to you first, Renee, and maybe you can answer some questions about your journey with data, where you started, you know, many, many years ago, what <laughs> kind of tools were you using? Um, I think you took us through that journey and it was interesting where you started and kind of where it is now. Um, so maybe you could start with uh, kind of answering that question. Is is BI, is telematics, is it new? Or how, how long has it been around? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as we talked earlier, I was data before data was cool. Um, <laughs> I've been in the uh, automotive industry for over 30 years, about 35 years in data. And, you know, when I went to college, I didn't, there, I didn't imagine I'd be in data. And uh, so it, it was kind of a new thing. Um, and when I first started and the tools were very rough. In fact, the first I can remember sitting down at the first computers that did not have this beautiful screen. It was just you type something out. I got in a car. I, I drove to a research building, picked up the printout and then tried to figure out what I just ran. <laughs> and if it was wrong, I repeated the process again. Um, but, you know, tools have come a long way. And, um, you know, I focused on um, quality and customer information and bringing warranty 
and to engineers so that they can go and you know fix items um, very quickly and understand the, the, the quality of their designs. And so when we looked at the capabilities that we grew over time, um, you know, things like telematics, when that came into play, and um, I can remember the first um, OnStar discussions um, at General Motors, um, OnStar started off as a, um, out of the Hughes relationship with General Motors. And um, it was back in uh, 92, when the first telematic um, component went in a vehicle, I can remember the old big um, D car, Cadillac D car, we call it the Brome, um, that big Brome that had that telematics in it. And I remember the first question that I was asked to being in warranty was how much warranty are we going to stay from over the air updates? That was back in 92. In 92. Wow. Yeah, we're still trying to figure out that question now. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you, the thinking back then was, hey, we've got this great capability. We know it's someday going to be great. And, um, and it is. I mean, as, as we're moving forward, more and more companies are starting to use that data to then see, okay, what are the actions? What's happening on that vehicle? What's happening with that, those sensors? And now I can get more predictive in the work that I'm doing, which is some of the work that we're doing. Um, but it, it has been fascinating watching this journey over time and the amount of, of uh, tools that you have now um, that can do um, you know predictive work that can do this um, business type analysis um, is, is is much greater than than what I started with and it has grown immensely uh, the capability in in the industry um, so it's it's been wow. a fun 1992. Uh, and printouts at the beginning. That's um, that's a great story there. So that reminds me a little bit. Um, so you know, I, I was at Delphi at the time, and and we had a um, some people working on the OnStar units um, that we produ produce in Kokomo, Indiana. But what a lot of people don't realize is the computing power and the data that it's generated by all the computers, the little microcomputers inside the vehicle itself. And what was fascinating when I worked at Delphi was we actually had a semiconductor fab in Kokomo, Indiana, um, producing microprocessors and chips because so many, much of what we produced was the computers, electronics that went into the cars. It, it was crazy that to realize that a car is just like this great supercomputing, you know, it, so many microcomputers on there. Um, and, and along those lines too, the other interesting thing was, you know, like OnStar over the air updates, um, I worked on a project that um, was getting updates um, over satellite um, over satellite radio. At the time, it was XM Rock and Roll were the two satellites. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a story that that I was talking to, to uh, Andrew and Tyler and everybody a little bit before the show. But you know, we we had over the air updates and um, dealer information that was getting pumped to the cars from from the satellites. And um, I one of the things I had to test was a no signal condition. <laughs> Since we were in Kokomo, we had a satellite repeater up on our roof. So I, had, I remember trying to drive around town and trying to figure out how to get a no signal condition. And what I ended up doing was wrapping the, the XM receiver module in aluminum foil, sticking it in a test briefcase, a Pelican, shoving it into the trunk of our car and then closing it. And I was like, ah, oh, finally, I can't hear the audio from the satellite, <laughs> so the data must be shut off, right? So, so, um, so lots of interesting stories as as we dealt with data, and you know that was a an example of trying to shut off the data. It was like we were getting this beam down to us. So like, how do I shut this off? Um, so you know we're get, um, so I'm gonna jump I'm gonna jump back to you, Renee, because I, I think it's fascinating what you're doing in terms of um, collecting data and providing that data as as a whole as an aggregate. Because I know. So many people are waiting on data, and sometimes it took OEMs and maybe the deal individual dealerships too long to get a kind of a market, total market space view of everything. And I think that that's kind of what you're doing. Um, but I, I'm going to jump to Tyler, and we'll come back to you. So, Tyler, um, tell tell us more about Freight Verify. So, um, are there any in, any interesting stories about you know impact that you've done? Because logistics is an interesting one, and you see more of that. You know, when before, right, you'd mail something or you'd ship something and it goes overseas and you're like, I hope this shows up, you know, a couple of weeks later or whatever. Or, but, but you're getting that data real time and really making an impact, right? So kind of tell us about what your company does and, and maybe if you have a good story about 
um, the impact of that data? Sure. That um, so we are really kind of a data aggregator in the logistics yeah. and supply chain space. So we have partnered with the uh, third party logistics providers. We've partnered with the carriers and then ultimately the OEMs that are ordering the uh, shipments. And so what we do is we take all of that data from each of those shipments and we aggregate it on a single platform. So uh, talking about telematics data, there were some very sweeping regulations uh, several years ago, almost maybe even a decade now, where the government said that we have to know and we have to be able to hold accountable um, essentially the trucking industry because there were so many accidents going on and uh, because they were working like crazy and trying to get product. And so we needed to be able to know when they were taking breaks, all that kind of stuff. And so ultimately, the trucking industry started to go through this technological evolution where the all of the vehicles or all the trucks were being low jacked, right? We knew exactly where everything was at a single time. And that really started to get pervasive throughout the industry. And so we're at this really awesome time where we can see where all shipments are, no matter where it is on the globe, whether it be an airplane, a truck, a rail shipment or a rail container. And so with the advent uh, too, with the vehicle telematics is we can see any vehicle in transit wherever we need to, right? So if we happen to quote unquote lose a vehicle, we can go and find exactly where it is in seconds, right? And, and that's mm -hmm. possible, right? Yeah. The the It's kind of a black box, some of these um, shipments because we don't always get to see exactly where that truck is at all times. So there are times where a vehicle can be sitting in a yard and it ends up lost. So a lot of what our product does is allows the OEMs and, and our customers to take action on dwelling product, right? We dwell as a big concept in our industry where if a product's mm. not moving, that's typic there's typically a problem, right? When product is not moving from the manufacturing facility to the essentially the dealer or the retailer. And so what our platform does is allows, um, every, allows our customers to see all of their product in transit and make decisions about where that product needs to go. Do I, um, do I hold this product in a particular lot because maybe there's a quality issue? Um, lots of different use cases where uh, we, an opportunity to um, help out our customers. One of the uh, areas I'm working on now is in ETA, so estimated time of arrival. And yeah. it's amazing how much cost can be taken out of um, products sitting in a plant by giving the customer a really great transit time, right? How much lead time do I need to give myself in order to ensure that I can only have the right amount of product on hand at, the, at one time, right? Because the more wow. product you have sitting in inventory is just extra cost, right? And that's yeah. extra cash that the business doesn't have to put into other areas. Um, so being so the whole concept of lean manufacturing, we're really able to take that and squeeze as much time out of that and as much cash out of that as possible. And so that's one of the really big impactful projects that I'm working on now is how do I enable or help enable customers to really trim that down and, and ensure that, you know, exactly what comes in comes out. And it's a very uh, uh, even flow of, of materials through the manufacturing process. Wow. Fascinating. So yeah, dwell time. I, you know, if you've got so many products and they're all, all different moving and all different channels, like which ones are really just in their normal lead times or where, where are the anomalies? Where's the one that's been sitting in a spot that's it should have left a week ago. So you can highlight and aggregate all that data. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, really so, cool. Stuff. Yeah. Um, I know of one use case where um, we helped GM a lot with the strikes, uh, the UAW okay. strikes. So 
Uh, when that happened, a lot of those are, I mean, a lot of the docks are, have a lot of unionized workers that um, took the strike. And so the shipping and logistics, the supply chain stopped overnight, yeah. right? So yeah. there's not one person that knows exactly where all of that product is, if it's at a supplier, if it's mid route, if it's sitting at a dock somewhere. So wow. that's one of the powers that, you know, that's one of the great things about this data is we can take it and, and show that in real time and, and say, you know, um, you know, this is 20 miles away from the plant. Uh, this is in the middle of the ocean or at, or sitting at a port somewhere. So we're right. starting to get really in depth in, in, in how to provide the best visibility to a, cu a customer's product as we possibly can. And then of course, overlay the analytics on that. Um, and help them make the yeah. best decisions for the business as possible. Wow, that's um, yeah. What a what a story. What a, what a great impact making to all these companies. And that reminds me too. You know, when I was in data 15 years ago, we had these units in the car that was just collecting, collecting, collecting data, and um, we kind of sat on it. For, you know, we weren't making the insights. We weren't utilizing it to to make a difference. Um, and increase productivity or see where things were. Because um, at the time, we just knew how to collect the data, but not really analyze it. But things have progressed so much. And now you're really seeing the, the predictive side um, come come into it. And we'll, we'll revisit that with Renee too. I think that's a big one. So um, I do want to jump to Andrew though. Um, Andrew, you've got a lot of fascinating experience, I think, in, in Bosch. I don't know if that was automotive. Um, yep. And then in transportation and kind of rail. Um, so, so give the audience some of the, you know, some of your data stories and, and what you saw, you know, I think you've got some in interesting insights too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. started, I started in the transportation industry working with data probably around 2012, uh, starting off with internships. I was in college, uh, with Ford motor company. Uh, we were doing some really interesting things where we were trying to improve the fuel economy of vehicles uh, just by leveraging the road grade as we were seeing it. So how much the, the road is, you know, on an upward slope or downward slope. So we were making these um, algorithms that would learn to summarize the terrain as you drove it and then use wow. that summary uh, in order to better use your cruise control uh, so you could get better fuel economy without having to have any sort of mapping information or any information downloaded from the cloud or anything like that. So that was kind of my initial jump into data and really got me hooked on what can we use data in order to be able to understand or at least get a good estimate of what's upcoming. Uh, because True. even if you can forecast reasonably accurate one or two steps in advance, uh, there are so many, so many applications for being able to do stuff just a little bit more intelligently. So wow. that took me through, uh, ended up going to Bosch doing autonomous vehicle work, left that to go do stuff in the railroad industry uh, with collecting rail geometry all across the United States to figure out what rail needs to be replaced, what rail is safe, uh, trying to prevent derailments. Uh, and then since then, it's kind of just been a whole bunch of smattering of projects, whether they're consumer products, uh, doing intelligent navigation within the home with, va uh, with vacuums or uh, working more with business level data and trying to help predict uh, or forecast uh, future sales. So kind of a, a wide yeah. smattering, but the, the bulk of it's been in the in the transportation industry. So, so it's fascinating. So you said rail the shape did you, did you say you were looking at shape of rail and how, how yeah can you dive into that like how what what was the data like that was coming in with you had yeah, dimensional so, drawing yeah it's a it's a really interesting problem so in the past uh they would have people manually go out with you know like mechanical tools to measure the space between uh the left and the right rail how much it was tilted oh. in or out the cant and then uh, rail, as it gets used, wears down. It basically like erodes over time. And so there's the the profile of the rail that gets tracked over time as well. Oh, and each yeah. of those measurements, once they start getting out of whack, they get 
worse faster. It's kind of like a thermal runaway problem. Like once it's bad, it gets bad worse oh. uh, and faster. So, and, and so you had this data that was coming in and you had profile and the wear and everything and distance between and Yep. And unfortunately, there's not just one type of rail out there. There's even more than dozens. It's probably an order of magnitude of about 100 different types of rails, and they don't all fit together when you want to replace them. And yeah. unfortunately, the railroads don't have fantastic records as to what gets replaced with what, because to keep costs low, they use whatever they have on hand. So the, the fundamental problem is when you get some rail profile coming in, and it's all worn down, uh, you have to identify what rail that is. But you're taking samples every single foot and it could change every single foot if it's a high traffic area. So there's no way if you were to look at rail across the entire United States uh, for you to kind of manually go through and check that. You have, to, you have to automate that. Otherwise you're gonna spend the rest of your life just trying to answer one question. Wow. So I'm I'm glad I asked you because you said rail shape and I was like, and, and yeah, people are out there measuring and taking profiles. Wow. Fascinating um, to prevent derailments. And then, yeah, because of cost, they could replace it and they don't have record of it. The traceability thing. So yeah. fascinating stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The analysis of that has been going on like automated for probably two decades now. Uh, yeah. But now the measurement of those of those pieces of rail is finally starting to get to the automation point where there's wow. embedded uh, systems that are now using lasers to detect the profile, the cant and all that yeah. stuff. So that way the, the collection uh, of that is also automated. So it's a little uh, weird in the railroad industry. It was almost reversed. The analysis almost was there before the automated data collection practices, which uh, I always thought was interesting. <laughs> wow. So I, I am glad I asked. That is um, some interesting stuff. Um, so I, I want to go back to, you know, kind of across all of us, and we've seen this, is the speed that at which we can analyze data, the speed at which the insights are being presented to the decision makers. Um, and, you know, and Renee, I want to visit this with you. And I, I heard some of this in, in Tyler's you know, present you know, what he talked about with Freight Verify too, is, you know, I heard this story the other day is there's retailers out there now um, aggregating data from, um, it was alcohol sales. There's a company out there that I'm gonna talk to on Friday three by three. And I think on some of his videos, he explains that he aggregates um, alcohol retail sales um, and then looks at the trends and sees pr price and volume differences. And before, you know, if you went to the manufacturer or the bottler, you know, they only had one sliver of data and it took weeks potentially to get it from all their retailers. And if you went to the retailer, they've got one set in one region and it took them, you know, they didn't know what the whole market was doing and how they compared. So, so now I'm seeing this trend where aggregators are coming in and it's brilliant because you're getting, pulling this data and it's real time and it's refreshed and it gives a baseline for everybody involved, like you connect the, basically this little sliver of the world, um, be it um, you know automotive warranty repair or, or automotive data or logistics data. Um, and Andrew, you probably have some stories too, but then the insights are, are mm -hmm. available instantly versus waiting weeks for somebody to process, get it back to you. So Renee, could, if you could expand a little bit up about what we predict does and kind of you know, your position in the, your market and what, what you've done, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you hit it, you know, just nail on the head there. It's um, when you, when you're in a company and you're in a manufacturer, no matter what kind of manufacturer, you get a lot of deep data about your own business and about what's working for you, what's not. But what you don't see is what's happening around you and yeah. where you can do better, where maybe you're not you know, maybe you're doing well and you need to promote. And so we took that same, um, actually at request of clients, that same view into looking at repairs and looking at um, product product experience in the market. And so so we're, we basically go out and, and collect, um, along with some of our strategic um, partners, we collect information from repair facilities across the U.S. 
And yeah, you know, we're talking, you know, those massive databases where you're, you know, 30 billion records, service records that we're, you know, bringing together that has a, a ton of information in it across all of the OEMs. Um, you know, it's looking at parts, it's looking at vehicles that maybe are outside of the OEMs, the OEM branded dealerships. So maybe that it's at independent facilities where customers are having to pay out of their pocket for repairs. Yeah. It could be a, a bad thing when they're about to buy a new vehicle. Um, but it's that, it's that whole transparency um, that we're able to give to the market now in a way that wasn't, wasn't possible before. I know when I was back at GM, I was always trying to understand, hey, is our warranty competitive? Are we, you know, is this rate, these great targets that we're setting, are these good? I mean, are they good enough or yeah. is it really better out there? And we would make up all sorts of stories about what better is because we didn't have the data. You know, we, it was something you just, you know, you estimated, but you didn't know. But now we can, we know and we can share. And so someone at GM could see really how is Toyota doing? How is Ford doing? what areas are they doing really well in some components what areas not so bad you know maybe not so well and yeah. similarly for suppliers suppliers in many cases were blind to they would have to wait for an oem to send them data or give them a call and say hey you know your part's not performing in the field what's going on and they're like what <laughs> you know what what situation um, so, you know, really providing everybody a way to look not only what's happening and what happened out in the field on your products, but on your competitors' products in a, in a similar way, but also what's about to happen. So maybe you're real comfortable and you think, well, I didn't see a whole lot out there yet. But in the next three years, that's going to grow to a very significant issue for you. And by the way, you're four times worse than everybody else. And so it's, it's that whole transparency that with these data sets that you could bring to the market to help people make the right decisions on, yeah, we need to, we need to have some kind of an action here, whether it's covered under warranty or not, we need to do something about this. Um, or maybe you were really good and we need to continue and make sure that same design gets into our future designs so that we don't try to re-engineer something that's already working very well. Um, so it really provides the rest of the story, you know, when it comes to what's going on out in the field. And it wasn't wasn't available previously. So we're, we're really excited about it. Uh, we've had a lot of um, great feedback, particularly a lot of like EV companies, you know, that have no data. Oh, so like, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? Wow, I didn't think that. Yeah, that's huge yeah. right now. Yeah. Right now. So, company you know we've got companies trying to that are trying to come into like a u.s market that want to know what where do i need to be to be competitive um m a so we've got suppliers um you know that are maybe moving ownership and someone wants to understand what's the risk of what that you know supplier produces out in the market what's it going to look like for the next several years so just really that transparency has been really outstanding to be able to provide back to the industry. And main thing is, you know, obviously we provide data and insight, but somebody needs to take action. And so helping companies take the right action or is really, uh, um, you can tell I get pumped about it. <laughs> it's really great. Hey, well, yeah. So I, I love that. I think all, all four of us are passionate about data. And I think um, somebody said that, it's on a, a different show I, I was on, um, but we're, we're impact junkies kind of way in that we love making an impact and power the, the power of data and the speed of data and the speed of the analysis now. And yeah. especially Renee and, and Tyler, the, the aggregation across where you can see um, where you can see your gaps, basically, um, and make an impact and really close those gaps for people and really make an impact because that. Renee, I, I think it's huge because I think there was a blind spot for so many years. People were guessing, people were making assumptions, and you you could move in a direction and not know what <laughs> if you were moving in the right direction. But now, now there's all this aggregated data where you can actually say, well, this is what the data is showing, and it's a baseline across the whole market. Right. So we can make certain certain decisions and certain steps and be pretty confident that yeah. you're you're addressing the gaps. Um, so, wow, that's, and yeah. oh, I, 
One of the big gaps too, I would say, is what happens outside of the warranty period. So I think all of the OEMs were really good at looking at, again, data they had, but they don't know anything about what they don't have. And mm-hmm. if the government came back to us um, and, and they were interested too in the fact that they felt there was this huge miss that once you get beyond three years, about 80% of the work that goes on goes on in independent service facilities and no one was seeing it um, collectively mm. to really understand other issues, other safety issues. And so we've been able to provide that view on, you know, again, that open transparency on, hey, what happens after it, you know, exits warranty and customers are paying for it themselves. And, and, and some of it could be a potential safety related issue that you, again, you want to get a handle on quickly. Wow. So that's true. I think you made that point the other day. Is, yeah, a lot of what OEMs were seeing was warranty data. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of data on repairs that was just being maybe not aggregated, not looked at. But here you're you're sitting there collecting the you know the aggregate, everything, and you yep. can provide feedback to the OEMs. It's like you only pay for the, you know, the, this right. stuff is covered under warranty. But look at this massive gap you have. Oh my this gosh, is incredible. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and speaking of gaps and maybe, um, you know, Andrew, maybe you have um, a, a story too, but um, I worked at a, a large firm um, and we had five or six different divisions and we did something brilliant. This was probably 10 years ago um, and it was along the lines of data aggregation, right? We took, um, I was in purchasing and we took aggregated data across all the our departments and we would look at the price we would pay for for certain parts you know, but the volumes were different. But um, what we found is we built this huge database across all their divisions. And I remember being able to get on a call with certain suppliers. I was like, hey, you supply all five of our divisions and this part's $5 here and it's a dollar here, for example. And I was like, well, why don't we just take the lowest price and, you know, you you just fix my pricing across all five of our divisions, right? And once the transparency was there and once the gap was identified, because they didn't know and we didn't know until we put that data together. But once it was all in one place, Mm -hmm. um, I remember within seconds, once you had the data, um, you could save the company like $50,000 in seconds. Right. And I was like, wow, when you have that aggregated transparency, like, you know, and you align everything and all the data matches, you know, there's there's huge savings and huge efficiencies. Um, so, I, you know, Andrew, I, you've worked a lot in data. Do you have any any good examples that you can give us? On, yeah, on I, I think I think the uh, that word that keeps coming up, transparency, is so huge for what data provides, right? Because it allows people to be able to get past the known and unknown and get really down to, like, what does my situation mean? So a, a, a project that I'm working on uh, quite recently is a sort of data aggregation project. Uh, we're working with dealerships, car dealerships across the United, uh, United States, and we have data on basically all the vehicles that are getting bought and sold, whether they're new off of the dealership lot, whether they're used as a result of a trade-in to a dealer or through a used car dealer. And so in knowing kind of all of the vehicles that are moving around, what year they are, what make, what model, uh, we're better able to help dealerships understand the quality of their inventory and then help them be able to forecast what their sales might look like next month based on the vehicles they have on their lot and what sort of vehicles are moving uh, throughout their region, excuse me, or the country. So yeah, there's just a lot of opportunities when you're able to kind of compile all of this information from very disparate resource uh, places and say, here's the landscape for you, right? And kind of here's where you're placed within that landscape and enables yeah. them to make better decisions like, well, I probably should get this, uh, I don't know, uh, more Ford Escorts on my lot because those are moving fast recently. Um, <laughs> But there's always the the challenges, right? Where when you ask for one vehicle as a dealership, the manufacturer might say, yes, you can take those, but you also must take these vehicles. 
And before having this transparency, they might not know what taking those ve additional vehicles on might mean for the quality of their inventory. But now they're able to take those sort of negotiations that happen back and forth and understand what it's going to do to their business. Wow. Fascinating. So, so yeah, you could look at the lot, look at the cars that are available, if they're new or they're used, and you can use that resale value, how certain brand, certain models, what year, how fast they're moving and provide predictions on sales. And, and so I was just reading and maybe you can comment on this, but I heard that vehicle sales, um, use cars because of the recession um because of you know nobody wants has you know can buy new cars anymore so so the inventory everybody's going after used cars so the inventory has just dropped um so i've heard that new new car sales are a little bit harder because you have more inventory now and you know you might get a better deal just because there's no inventory of the used cars right have you read some of that or i've, I've heard it's, some of yeah, it's a it's a very interesting time right now in car sales. Uh, yeah. You can pretty much, if you look at um, if if we had some of the charts in front of that we we typically look at once COVID hit, uh, just all the rules went out the window, all the predictive modeling went out the window because this is no matter how much data you have and how smart you are working on that data or lucky, um, nobody's got a crystal ball. And some of these things are like, you can't forecast the information that's not existing in the data. And mm. COVID yeah. isn't one of those things that you're gonna see in your data set before it happens. Uh, but yeah, it's a really interesting time because yeah, people aren't necessarily ready to spend a lot of money on a new vehicle. And there's also, um, these uh, vehicle rental companies, I forget exactly which one it was, uh, but they're going out of business and liquidating Hertz, their, yeah, Hertz. Mm -hmm. They're liquidating all their used vehicles. So there's like a half a million used vehicles uh, that are ready to kind of flood the used vehicle market. So which ones are the, the better ones to get a good deal on? Uh, it probably really depends on what region you are in, whether there's, uh, used vehicles getting flooded by the uh, liquidation oh. or if your dealer's been hurting on sales lately uh, it's, it's very very hard blanket statement to make that's a fascinating one because yeah the hurts um nobody's renting cars and then if they're selling their cars do they have uh, like a, a parking lot and where is that located so would they give it to the nearest dealerships and then flood that market Wow, fascinating stuff. Um, so like these first order things that we're able to predict using a massive amount of data, you know, those are getting more and more powerful. Like when is this part gonna break down? When might you yeah. sell this vehicle? But those second, third, fourth order impacts with the whole network is just gonna require a whole lot more data aggregation that's not just specific to a niche. Like here's all the vehicles in the United States. You might need something like here's all the vehicles and all of the parts on those vehicles and when they get repaired and warranty but also here's some healthcare data how do we tie all of those things together in a meaningful way yeah. uh, we're not quite there yet but i'm sure in a decade or so we will be doing some really interesting things at that level of aggregation yeah wow um so so that reminds me you were talking about um kind of predictive analytics so this was 2002 um i worked on a system and it collected all the data, you know, there's FCAN, BCAN, GANET, there's all these uh, communication buses in, in vehicles. And we had a, a system that would listen on all the buses and collect data. It's like, oh, this module is reporting this error code, this DTC, and, and you know, we're aggregating. And then at the time, um, we didn't have a lot of ways to send data back to like a, a central server to analyze. So we were depending on um, Bluetooth, um, the data channel on your phone. So you had to have a data and not a lot of people had data. So you know, I think it was like less than 0.1% of people actually use this feature. But it was, it was kind of crazy. We we're collecting all this data in the vehicle and then trying to send it back to the server, but nobody had the pipeline, right? So we couldn't send it back. But the whole idea was they wanted to look at all that data and start seeing, you know, it's like, man, this pressure sensor, you know, once it starts this reading, we know that it's going to break down. It's it's just mm -hmm. that reading 
indicator. And, you know, we're going to order the part. And then, you know, we were going to use the satellite system to beam that signal down. And, and it was going to be really cool because your car, we were going to send a signal and say, hey, we, we noticed this reading on your this sensor. So, um, by the way, we've already ordered the part. We know it's going to fail in a month. And um, we sent it to your dealership, um, you know, in town. And here's a couple of um, appointments. So pick pick the one you want it, right? And then you just drive in and it's already there. Like, we that was the crazy thing is this was... 15 years ago, <laughs> you know, and, and mm-hmm. it, it just goes to show, you know, we, we didn't have the infrastructure in place at the time. We were collecting all this data. We had visions on where we wanted to go with the data, um, but but we just didn't have the infrastructure and the, the data collected to, to make an impact. But I think now we have that. And then what you're talking about, Andrew, is we're pr- potentially going beyond that and, and looking even further at the network effect and aggregating yeah. and looking beyond. Yeah. So... Um, Tyler, I want to go to you real quick because you've worked on those kind of systems too. I, I don't know if you have a good story about, you know, data collection back in the day and and your experience. Um, so probably one of my early forays into data analytics and really understanding the power of data mm-hmm. um, was in my uh, quality, reliability, and durability job at uh, General Motors. I worked in infotainment, um, and infotainment was a pretty broad space it it, uh comprised of onstar the hmi modules meaning the computer that runs your infotainment system the screens and all that kind of stuff um there was a time when a certain component was uh actually going missing from vehicles so there was a pit and a did essentially that um reported the presence or the absence of a particular part and we noticed as we were looking at some of this uh, vehicle, the telematics data being sent back to us, was a lot of these vehicles were, were reporting a missing component, essentially in transit or in um, in even the manufacturing facility. So manufacturing was saying, we're installing the parts, right? We're, we're not doing anything different. We're not, we don't believe that we're missing the installation process, but yet we were still having data reported back to us that said you're missing a component out of this vehicle so we were able to actually locate um there are a couple different problems there but through the vehicle telematic data and these pids and dids we could through transit track the status on each vehicle and when one would go missing right when it would when we'd have successive statuses where it said that component was missing we could easily track down the point at which it said it was gone and we could you know identify was it stolen was it simply not installed at the plant um there are some other hardware issues that went along with that but um yeah vehicle telematics was great for helping to quickly problem solve because that data was being adjusted and analyzed every day we had a whole system built up um in infotainment where we would read warranty claims every single day and we would read um survey survey feedback every single day so if there's any illusion about whether or not the oems read all this quality data um there shouldn't be because we looked at it all and we bucketed bucketed and classified all of it so that we could get better about understanding not just at the current time but from a predictive standpoint what are the customer issues going to be and which ones were most impactful and we would go after those first right the pareto principle so that was a big part of my job in uh in the qrd position was wrangling all that data together putting the story of what are the main customer issues how much will it help us and then ultimately how much cost savings are we going to have and how much um are we going to improve customer satisfaction scores which um, at the time was JD Power. We were really focused on JD Power, um, and we have been for a long time. But uh, through some of these aggregation ex- um, projects, we were able to put a very, very good storyline together about what was going on in the entertainment system for a particular vehicle line or vehicle or uh, however we wanted to split the data. So, Wow. No, this is cool. Um, so if the audience didn't know, Tyler, one of his dreams is to do a TED talk, right? And before this, (laughs) 
we were just talking, Tyler's like, I wonder what I'm so passionate about and uh, what I could speak, right? Um, Tyler, I, I think I just saw some of that passion in, in what you were talking about. I think you're too passionate about data. So um, I, I saw it there. Um, so Andrew and Tyler and Renee, wow, we, we've spent, so, you know, 44 minutes, 45 minutes now talking about data and, and the impact that we're all making. Um, this is incredible, right? Especially the stories that you brought to this show. Um, but I'm gonna lighten the mood a little bit um, and I'm gonna go back to Renee. And um, so so this is what I promised at the beginning of the show is um, we've got some listeners online that that may be waiting on this. So Renee, can you tell us a little bit about that um, the elephant thing you have back there and, and your story with that? You're not gonna believe it. <laughs> <laughs> So I was uh, I, I had uh, global um, analytics responsibility for um, for General Motors. So I spent a lot of my time over in a lot of different um, a lot of different burgs overseas. And in, uh, India was one of the ones I traveled to. And after a um, hellacious thirty hour flight um, travel back and forth to get into India, get into New Delhi. So my driver, who has been at the airport since three o'clock a.m the previous morning, picks me up, you know, at the, at the airport to take me to my hotel. We're going in, in New Delhi. We're getting on what I would call a highway. I don't know. You know, it looks like a highway. And there I look over, I'm thinking either I'm groggy or I'm dreaming or something's going on. But I look over in, in what I would consider the fast lane. Here's uh, a gentleman on the back of an elephant leading it along. This elephant's flying down the fast lane. Next thing you know, we're pulling into the fast, you know, next to this elephant, and elephant didn't like it, and boom, he crashed right into our car. So I have officially been in an elephant accident. And then I asked the gentleman, I'm like thinking, okay, this is like the dog ate your homework. No one's going to believe this story that an elephant hit his car. So you know, shouldn't we stop and make a police report? You know, again, the typical American response. And he's like, oh, no, lady, we stopped, we killed. <laughs> and so I was, uh, I was trying to help him out because I didn't think anybody else would believe it either. But as soon as I saw the elephant there, I figured it's the only thing that would fit in my bag to go home. <laughs> oh, wow. Amazing story. Um, and then when we talked, um, you said, you know, nobody would believe it, right? And I said, well, I believe you, Renee, because, um, and, and I, I put up, over here, my my elephant picture, and this one is actually elephant. So two quick stories. Um, this one over here is from Thailand, and I'm half Thai, and um, I was going to a, a beach resort in Hua Hin every year, and there was an elephant they would walk around named Bert, and uh, he would greet all the, you know, and shake all the tourists' hands and stuff. So we would always greet Bert. And we went back one year to the same resort, and um, th there was a baby elephant out in kind of the front lawn and under a canopy. So I went to pet it, right? And <laughs> I told you guys this story already, but this is good, good for the audience. So I, I went up and started petting it and he wrapped his trunk um, around my right leg and picked me straight up into the air. So I just grabbed onto the front of his head and I was holding onto his ears. <laughs> right? And then um, my dad got freaked out. So he went and pushed the elephant and this little baby elephant, you'd be surprised how strong they are, but he just flung me. I probably flew like 20 feet, right? He just, and then he squared up and just rammed my dad. And he went flying back and he hit the post. And we ran in and told the hotel, we're like, oh, Bert, that baby elephant, he's attacking people. And they said, no, 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 no. He's not attacking people. That's how he plays with people. Um, so we could probably put a sign up or something, right? So, so that's that story. But then this thing over here, so in Thailand, um, they outlawed logging and elephants were used to pick up um, the trees for, you know, for the logging industry, but you know, the, the forests were clear cut. So then the elephants started going into Bangkok and walking through the streets. And Renee, you saw an elephant in India walking the street, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so they built a sanctuary and they taught elephants to play instruments, um, band instruments, and also to paint. And they also made the, um, I think that the paper, they were trying to, you know, just build products and make products. So that's made of um, elephant dung. They took the f fibers from elephant poo, made the fabric, and then we watched this elephant paint this picture. So the mahout would hand the paintbrush to this elephant. Elephant would oh. put the dots. It's, it's a flower bouquet. <laughs> so, and then he, he really would, good. you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> the elephant did a great job with that. So, um, so, so that's my story. And then they did I so they also train the elephants to play in a band instrument. So yeah. one was um, banging crazy. on a gong, and then there was another one playing on the xylophone, and then they had different elephants playing different instruments. So incredible experience. I was like, never in, yeah, I'd ever think I would go to a place and see an elephant painting and be able to buy it and um, watch them play instruments. But on that note, so we're approaching 50 minutes. Um, there's a few audience members, so that was a little lighthearted. Um, a few audience members out there that, um, and this is going to be important too, because I've just seen explosion in Power BI in business analytics. Um, you know, Andrew, Tyler, Renee, you, you, you're seeing it too. It's going to another level because it's filling the gaps. It's providing companies with so much value. Mm -hmm. um, the speed at which the gaps are being identified, the transparency, so you can make decisions that that make an impact and you're pretty sure they're gonna impact because you can see the gaps visually now. You know, this is changing everything. But one of the things, speaking of gaps, is, you know, training. Um, if, if you were, you know, at Purdue or, or you know, I'm, I'm gonna shout out to Purdue Boilermakers here, um, but at any other school, um, you know, and you're a student and you wanna get into this business, you know, Andrew, uh, Tyler, you, you've mentioned this before, but maybe you can reiterate. And then Renee, you know, what do you look for? What should these students study, um, you know, to get into this field? And what kind of experience should should they do? So maybe we'll do a round table real quick. Maybe Andrew first and then Tyler, then sure. Renee. Yeah. So my, my uh, experience is mostly in machine learning and the... Uh, I won't call it the language of choice, uh, but the one I'd highly recommend since it's so prevalent is Python. Um, I started off my career with C, C++, MATLAB, doing all this embedded stuff. Um, but the, the strides that have been made using Python and the libraries and the frameworks that are available, uh, it would be probably the number one item on my list for somebody wanting to get into machine learning saying, you should spend significant time getting very, very comfortable with Python because mm -hmm. you're going to end up using it regardless. Uh, but it's a fantastic and highly productive language. So it's good for plenty of other things than just machine learning. You can do web scraping, scripting, all kinds of good stuff with it. So highly recommend yeah. uh, mastering Python for getting into this type of stuff. I've seen some of the stuff with web scraping. That's a, that's a whole other fun world that you could get into. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So Tyler, what, what's your advice to impart on the next generation of data analysts and share your passion with them? How, how do they get into this? Um, so I'd say really focus on the stats and math, uh, the mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, I did not take that as seriously in high school. Um, and now I'm kicking myself uh, because there's so many cool applications for mathematics and, and STEM in general. Um, there's going to be few industries in the world where you're not going to need some sort of, um, you know, mathematics knowledge, some stats knowledge uh, to be able to apply some of these tools. I'd say um, really, Try your best to find something that you're really passionate about. It does. It could be accounting. It could be uh, industrial engineering. It could be anything. But where you really start to round yourself out and build your own brand and competitive edge is to dive into the analytics. Right? You can have analytical skill sets and tools and be able to apply them to all kinds of business problems because. You can write an algorithm, but if it doesn't solve a problem, if it doesn't solve a business problem, there, you know, it doesn't matter in in the long run, right? You need to solve a problem, and so I would advocate for really being uh, conscientious about what you go study. And there are tons of resources online to go learn Python and R, and learning how to take those tools and skill sets and apply them to real world problems that you really care about. Um, you know, whether that be improving products, um, designing new products, anything like that all has 
some application of data analytics in it. And so really you're getting into this world where you're going to need a specialization in, in a few different areas. And I would recommend, you know, um, not just going to school and doing a, an accounting degree or an, or a mechanical engineering degree. It's supplementing with something in analytics or being able to uh, go out, get some data, analyze it and make a data driven decision off of that. Oh, wow. Powerful stuff. Yeah. I think you, you tapped into a couple of good themes and I'll, I'll recap too, because um, just, just finding what you're passionate about and then augmenting that with your analytics is kind of been my strategy too. And it's so powerful because then you're driven to learn that new topic, but then, then you can differentiate yourself from everybody else because you have that dashboard. Now, if you study the data in that market, you have the gaps and the visibility and the transparency into into that market, and you can make a difference. Um, and talk about you know, and come on my show and talk about the impact you're making in the world. So, um, so yeah, no, Tyler, that was uh, that's a huge one for for you know somebody wanting to get into analytics and and why and how you should augment that with with potentially something you're interested in and and in learning. So. Um, Renee, so any any advice you would give, and who do you look for, you know, in, in your business? What type of, you know, is do people have the skill sets, or are you would you recommend to the people watching our audience that there's a certain skill set that you're looking for that there's a gap? What are the data patterns? I guess you're you're seeing. Yeah, I I totally agree with what Andrew and Tyler both said. I mean, there's a side that's very technical where you know you need to have some understanding of you know SQL and and all you know programming language and C Python. Um, there's a huge piece that just statistics and really understanding the analytical approaches that you can take to certain real real world um, world problems, you know, is, is very important. So we really look for somebody that has kind of a combination of that kind of that technical and that math background that can bring uh, those two aspects together. But the real the real meat of it is Tyler. What you just said is really understanding the business, and so really taking um, taking that approach where I okay I understand the how how to get there and how to get the answer out, but the the why you know, why is that important? How can I make a difference? What are the things that I that you know I need to tell somebody else? because they're they won't figure it out themselves and so you have to really help people make that connection with the data to understand not only what's possible but also what does it say and what do you do with it and help them make that those connections so i look for people that can have that kind of that business side of it as well and that value um, proposition to be able to bring that together along with bringing the technical skills a lot to ask, I know, but it's, you know, it, it really is important to look at what are you going to do with the, you know, that great data that you're collecting, as you said, you know, people are collecting it for years, but until you really start using it and you know the value, um, then people won't do anything with it. So, um, and I also encourage people to look at all sorts of different size companies. Um, mm -hmm. So I had the, the experience of going from large to medium to some, you know, a smaller company now, and they've all been great experiences. So, I mean, it's, you see, and today I see so many more opportunities that, you know, in, in the past it's been, let's everybody go for the big companies, you know, so we had the GMs and the Fords, and that's a great experience in and of itself. And then I went to JD Power, and I consider that kind of a medium company, and that had a different feel and different level of experience. And now going to a small company, and then really seeing the power of what you do it's, it's a truly valuable experience. Um, and, and you know, again, the size of the company doesn't matter. It's really what you're going to get out of it. But you can have a great ride through any any level organization if, it's, if you're passionate about it. Oh, wow. Thank you, Renee. So this is um, great insights. Um, I'm going to probably chop up this section of the video and, and do its own little video post um, and along the lines of what Renee, Renee saying is saying um, so there was all this I believe this and I've heard this from my mentor Avi Singh too but there's this disconnect between kind of the IT technical world and then the business and and kind of the insight world and the business side was always waiting for the reports and, and it, there was this lag in getting the data and and then you know there was always this complaint of well this report 
you know, I scoped it and they delivered exactly that, but they didn't go beyond. It's like, what are the insights or were you really looking for this? Um, and, but, but the business people didn't have the technical side and then the technical side was waiting and always, you know, trying to, but there's some, some off the shelf tools now that's bridging the gap. And so you're getting a lot more business people kind of bridging the gap and learning some of these technical skills. And then the other way too, technical people, you know, learning from you, like what you're saying, Renee, is they need to learn the, the analytical, the business side and get the insights out of data because data and a report is no good if you can't make a difference and a change in your company and do insights. So um, super powerful stuff. What a way to, to end this um, episode. Um, Tyler pinged me this morning and said, Charles, I think this video is going to be very, very impactful. Going to mean a lot to a lot of people. <laughs> Tyler, I think you're right. Um, I'm gonna chop this video up and and do you know smaller segments um, and and broadcast this out. And I'll I'll let you, Renee, Andrew, and Tyler know when those videos go out because I think what we have just presented in this video is gonna have a lot of um, impact on on future generations getting into this business. So, um, but that said, it's been an hour. Um, I, I'm going to end the show now. And then um, if you could just hang on for a second, we'll 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 have our own little chat after this. So Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks, Charles. Yeah, thank you.